couple of weeks ago, I asked you guys on Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube to submit any questions you had for me, and you guys submitted a lot of them. And in this video, I'm going to try to answer all of them. I went ahead and grouped related or repeated questions into categories, and it appears that there are three distinct categories that you guys have questions about. Those categories are new to software engineering, career progression in tech, and finally, the usual suspect artificial intelligence. I'll start with the first category and make my way down the other two. All right, let's get started. Okay, the first question here is, does the tech stack I learn in the beginning matter on the long run? Well, the short answer for you is that it does not uh, because if you're going to have a good career, you're gonna learn a lot of stacks over the course of your career. And one or two of them being outdated or not the most in demand doesn't really matter in the long run. The next question is, what can a CS student do to get a great job? The usual ones, good grades, recommendations, meaningful and challenging projects. Um, and while you're at it, make sure that the basics are taken care of and you learn the fundamentals of CS. And that in involves your data structures and algorithms. But that's just the basic, right? Outside of that, your best bet to get a full-time job is through an internship. And I've already said this in one of my videos before, that an internship is the easiest way or the easiest job interview essentially to a full-time job. So try to get as many internships as you can in college, but at least get one. Next question, what are the best undergraduate degrees to take? Well, if they teach you the fundamentals of data structures and algorithms, that's the core of computer science. It doesn't really matter if you go to data science or software engineering or typical computer science specialization or machine learning or whatever, as long as you cover the core basics and fundamentals. Eventually after that, um, you can follow whatever your interests are and whatever you enjoy um, as uh, your passion. Can I crack coding interviews without doing lead code? Absolutely. If you already know the fundamentals and your problem solving is sound, you should be able to crack the interviews just fine. It's all college level algorithm questions anyways. So if you're fresh with that, you can certainly do it. But the problem for most of us is that we end up working for a number of years in the industry and, and you generally don't end up using that kind of algorithms every day. So you kind of get rusty. That's when uh, you tend to practice lead code to sharpen up your uh, problem solving skills, right? But keep in mind that um, I'm using lead code here almost like a verb, like Googling, meaning searching on the web, right? Um, as long as you're practicing your problem solving data structures algorithms, you could do it yourself. You could gather your own questions. You can read it from a book. You can use a various number of other competitors that lead code has. It doesn't have to be lead code as well. How to start learning data structures and algorithms. Generally, They'll teach you that in your college degree, but there are a ton of free resources online in YouTube or articles around the internet. There are books, uh, various online courses that you can pay for. There are also services like boot camps or uh, fellowships that are specifically geared towards brushing up your data structures and algorithms. I also have a video called The Complete Coding Roadmap if you wanna get started with data structures and algorithms, so check that out. It's free, it's not gonna ask for your credit card. Internet is filled with advanced how do you filter through? I hear you. Um, that's a huge problem these days because everyone wants to make YouTube videos and give advice because the platform is there and all you need is a camera phone and you're on your way to making videos. Um, and if you've got good creative skills to make nice thumbnails, your content doesn't really matter. YouTube tends to prioritize titles and thumbnails over anything else. And that means that there is a lot of bad advice, but people who know very little about giving advice or even have any training at mentorship at all. Because if you think of it in some way, 
giving broad advice to a large group of uh, people um, does feel like mentoring in some forms and mentoring requires years of training. It's not something you just do uh, out of a whim, right? I can go on about this, but honestly, I already have a video where I discuss this exact thing. It's titled How YouTube Could Be Ruining Your Software Engineering Career, where I talk about how this is a problem and what are the things that you can do to kind of filter out and catalog your own uh, knowledge base, essentially. So. If you have time, go check that one out. That will do a much better job at answering this question than me repeating the same stuff. So this next question is about working on a deprecated technology like Angular um, and if it could be a bad thing for your career. In a general way, it could be a bad thing to your career to work on legacy code. But if that's the only thing you do, right? Um, again, like as I answered with stack you choose not mattering earlier in this video, you may work with something that is legacy for a brief period of time, and that's okay. As long as you move on to something else, and as long as you have other things that you've worked on, sometimes business requirements, wrong place at the wrong time, everybody has to do it, right? I've worked on legacy code, and I'm sure a lot of you have too, but that's not ruined my career, because then once that's over, you work on something else. So if you're actively working towards finishing that project and also looking forward to moving to something else. And there's processes and um, everything else play in place to do that. And you have communications with your manager, then you should be fine. But at the same time, I wouldn't worry about Angular. It's not that bit of outdated technology. Sure, we've moved on from Angular, but it still has concepts that applies to most modern frameworks, right? Uh, I'm not an expert in Angular. I think the last time I used it was around eight or nine years ago, but um, Angular has concepts of single app components, routes, and all that, right? Like those are things that are still widely adopted in frameworks like React and all that, right? So you can still learn a lot from using an older framework as long as it relates to uh, something new and modern. Okay, so now we're moving on to the next section where the questions are related to career progression. What are some great questions to ask during manager one-on-ones? There is no such thing as a great question, right? What you should be instead thinking of is aside from casual chat and fun conversations about the weekend, what topics at a high level should you focus on with your manager, right? And some of the main ones are your impact, like your projects, how they make impact to the overall product or the organization in general, technical growth, your whether your projects are challenging enough that help you grow technically. And the third one is career progression, right? Like, have you had enough growth and impact um, to continue progressing in your career? So those are the three things you want to focus on and what you specifically uh, want to hone in it depends on your case. But also when you have these conversations, try to be quantitative and whatever area it is that you want to improve on, start the conversations early and give yourself and your manager time to evaluate the progress. Okay, next question is how to transition from mid-level to senior software engineer. This kind of relates to the previous question because your manager is the one that is probably largely responsible for putting you up for promotion, which essentially means you're progressing from mid to senior, right? Um, the main things that enable you to jump to the next level is scope and impact of your work and how you have grown technically, but also helped others grow as well, right? One of the key things about growth early on is that Initially, you're just required to grow by yourself. You achieve a few things, you deliver a few projects, and you're on to the next level. But as you go to a higher level, just growing yourself isn't enough. You have to help people that are junior to you grow and accomplish things as well. So I just wanted to put a note to that one. In general, the higher the position, the larger these expectations are. So start taking on larger, more challenging uh, work whose scope uh, spans across multiple teams. And while doing that, you're also leading some newer engineers or junior engineers who have less experience than you. So the next question is, when do you know you're ready for promotion? This is also related to the previous two questions. Uh, the best indication that you're ready for the next level is when you're already operating at the next level. It doesn't matter 
how many years you've been at a certain level or when one or more projects were successful or you've checked off these random list of requirements. It only matters when you're meeting or exceeding the requirements of the next level. Um, so if you're going to have this conversation with your manager, don't have it at the time of review and asked why you weren't promoted or am I gonna get promoted this review cycle? It's too late to have that conversation and you'll end up getting disappointed. If you want to be promoted, a uh, tip I have is to bring up the conversation at least a year or so earlier. Ask what the expectations are for the next level, then start operating or working at that level right away. And then every few months, do a check-in with your manager to see if you are in line with what the expectations are for the next level. If you've been doing that for almost a year, putting you up for promotion, a person who's already been performing at the next level is a very easy case for your manager to make. How important is mentorship when you are in a new place? Mentorship is critical, not just when you're in a new place, but throughout your life and even whether it pertains to your career or not. I think you need to always have mentors. I'm a huge believer of this. But because you mentioned a new place, make sure you do understand the distinction between needing a mentor versus needing a ramp up buddy. A ramp up buddy is someone who helps you with your day to day tasks, helps you ramp up in the project, answers your day to day questions until you are familiar with whatever team or project you're working on. So you pester them, bug them nonstop until you feel comfortable. That's what they're assigned to. Their one and only job is to make sure you transition as smoothly and quickly into a project as possible. With mentors, you have high level discussions on broader topics, whether it's technical, related to your career or out of some other curiosity. Could your ramp up buddy and mentor be the same person? Absolutely. But just make sure you understand the difference because you probably wouldn't want to go to your mentor and ask what this random exception is in your code base. All right, that's all we have for the career progression section. Let's move on to artificial intelligence now. So the first question here is, what is the impact of artificial intelligence on developers and how to avoid it? I just recently made a video talking about the impact of AI on software engineering in the near future. But what I don't understand about this question is why avoid it? I mean, you should embrace it. It's, it's, it's a change like anything else. Um, be open to change and adapt to it. Yeah. And I, I definitely talk about more details on how it could actually aid software engineers. And that could be a good thing. Um, but definitely it's not something to be scared of or avoid in general. Definitely check that video out that I just published. Uh, kind of talks about chat GPT, but also covers the broader AI scope. So that will answer this question in more detail for you. So next question is, the market is competitive, AI is taking jobs away. Doesn't seem like a question, more like a claim, but yes, market is competitive and market being competitive is a good thing. That means that the level of engineering is high and the people that get jobs get very good compensation and packages and get to work with uh, really smart individuals. Um, you just have to make sure that you're good enough to land the job, right? Um, this is true with any industry. Um, you can't expect to get a job because there's no competition and you are the only choice left, right? Uh, you expect to get the job despite of the competition and because you are better qualified than the rest. And um, as far as AI taking jobs away, this statement cannot be further away from the truth. AI is not taking software engineering jobs away. If anything, it's probably making your job easier by taking away all the mundane tasks and automating them and making your life easier so that you can focus on the real challenging stuff. Um, again, check the video out. I talk about this in a little bit more detail over there. Transition to AI slash machine learning or continue software engineering. Why do these paths need to diverge? Um, to be successful in modern engineering role, you need a bit of everything. Uh, you need to understand the entire scope of engineering, how things are built, how data is gathered, how it is sanitized, how different models can help predict, forecast, explore outcomes, how to fine tune those models and improve your product and then make those changes in code. A well-rounded and marketable software engineer understands the entire product delivery loop, not just limited aspects of it. So embrace machine learning in part of your development pipeline. It's a good thing. 
And that's it. Um, there were some other questions. I hope I kind of merged them into similar questions and answered them. But in general, if you like this AMA style video and if you want me to do it once in a while, definitely hit the like button because uh, it helps with the algorithm. And it also lets me know that you guys liked it and I should continue making these kind of videos, right? But for now, this is it. And thank you so much for all the questions. You guys are awesome. And I hope my answers did some justice and provided at least some direction for you to follow up to. I'll see you in the next one. Cheers. Cheers.